complete wrap-up of all the NBL action with highlights of games in this weekend's Mitsubishi Challenge. Then we cross the Pacific to check out the NBA. It's called the most exciting basketball league in the world. Let's start with a play that, like anything good, you have to take slowly. Isaac Burton, confronted by Simon Dwight's awesome presence, turns a dunk into a sweet lay-in. Now that's great hands, great adjustment. Well, no need to adjust this. What's wrong with David Van Dyke? He's an excitement machine. In fact, it was a great weekend for the big guys. And here's a tandem play, JR and Stiffy. Sounds like a good name for a cartoon show. Ever in trouble? Give it to me. And the D train just rolls on. Slam and Sam warming up for Atlanta and a date with the draft, perhaps? Transition plays. Good gallop here from Goodwin. Go to the hole. He means business. But the Tigers, how's this for a feed at speed? Good start. That was spectacular teamwork from the Tigers. Assists. Rick Brunson was hot from everywhere last weekend. This was even better. They gotta get stops for one thing. Now the way to do it. And this, not bad at all. Oh, that is a to Catalini. Darnell Me again. Nice penetration, and Simon Dwight dines out on the dish. And here's that classic gaze give. Blocks and JC lets Roop Sapwell know there are no cheap baskets, not even in the arena. And David Van Dyke makes one of his nine against the Falcons. Mighty ball there, land off. David Van Dyke for seven blocks. But let's finish with a great finish. Marty McLean on the buzzer. McLean, long three pointer, and oh. there we go. <laughs> Bigger. That's the problem faced by anyone who tangles with Brian's boys. The first quarter was pretty tight. Nice little lob from Kelly to Dorge. Now back out to McCaffrey, who spots up for three. He had seven points in the first quarter. Nice pass. McKinnon gets it inside. Ronaldson with the jam. Wriggles around a bit. He's on his way to a handy total in this game. Now, despite errors like these, sort of a breakdown of the Gold Coast offense, transition basket two coming up from Ronaldson. This is nice play from the Magic. Good D, though, from... McClendon or McLean to get back there. The Magic did struggle a little bit against the Rollers. Trevor Torrance here with a jumper for three. His only three of the second quarter. This was a wrestling match. The Rollers literally would not let go. Typical play there from the dog, Wayne Larkins. Mike Kelly hits the three. How important is this play to the Magic's title chances? He can do anything when required. Wayne Larkins, though, responds. He was isolated. He takes the shot. But the perimeter wasn't where this game was won. Nice lob here from Peter Harvey. Inside, and the D train gets two draws of foul. That was one of Harvey's eight assists for the game. Tony Ronaldson, again, on transition. Workman-like play, looking good for Atlanta. He scored consistently throughout the four quarters. Here's another tray. He took 11 shots out there, scored only three of them, though. Chad McClendon shows his inside presence. That's another two points. But in the third quarter, that long magic bench started to wear down the Gold Coast. Guess who? Larkin still active on the fast break this time, but they trailed by eight at three-quarter time, the Rollers, and getting a little weary. Ronaldson had nine points in that same quarter. Now, in the final term, all but one of the Magic players scored. This from a Gold Coast miss. And on transition, Parkey just holds it up, fires it out, and eventually, good ball movement, Ronaldson gets the three. Dwayne McLean, well, the disappointment for the Rollers was that he shot only 24%, 5 of 21 against that massive... Southeast Melbourne front court. And as McCaffrey gets in for three of his 20, the Magic outscored them 27-14 in the stretch. That was pretty much the game, Slam and Sam, with a trademark end to a solid performance. John Dorge equaled the record for blocked shots against the Rollers with seven. Chris Anstey, the Magic's other giant, also had a game worth noting. He fouled out for the first time in his career, but his six fouls came in just eight and a half minutes. We'll be back with more Sunday ladder this weekend. They met at the arena, a match that promised plenty of highlights. Geelong had a pretty good hold on this game from the first quarter. Sapwell drives baseline, lays it in. Now with Svaldenis settling into the lineup again, his second game on the way back from injury, Jonathan Roberts found it a little tougher. He does tip in here though. Ray O's with a jumper for Geelong. 
Good battle in the front court, actually. Rebounds were going to be important to this game. O's makes a steal, but the very quick Darren Smith fouls him after the fast break. Now, here's the new guy in the Cats lineup, isolated for a three point attempt, Bill Wilson. Hits, but inside, well, Hobart was setting things up pretty well. Stiff gets two. And Mark Nash, he shows the benefits of winning the rebounding 41 29. Gets the loose tip in. Nice play from the young man. This is one of his best games, actually. There was more to this than rebounds, though, as it turned out. Simon Curl hits the three. Geelong, in fact, shooting 44% from outside. Now, Hobart, there you go. They missed. Even though they did eventually get the bucket, they shot only 23% from the perimeter. Simon Curl again, similar position. On his way to a team high 20 points. And this is where Geelong was able to counter that rebounding deficit. Nice ball movement coming up here from the Cats as well. Now in the end it goes to the Terminator for two. Beautiful pass. The Cats led 53-42 at half time. Roberts, well, he toiled away. Nice jam. He pulled eight boards and shot 30 points. Can't do much more. Greg Smith showed, though, that Ian Stacker has a lot of strength in the backcourt. This is where Geelong did well. Nash, well, he did it from everywhere for Hobart. Two of five from the perimeter. Here we go. He had 18 boards and 20 points at 82%. Ray O's again. Geelong made it 81-67 at three-quarter time, and that was probably enough. They didn't look like losing. Jerome Scott unable to dominate against a team that recently cut its point guard and is still sorting out that position. Bill Wilson played only 16 minutes for the Cats. Matt Scalzi, nice probing pass, and O's climbs on the end of it with a jam. Alley-oop this time. Geelong, well, they're outscored in the final quarter, but not by much, not by enough. For Hobart's good. Scalzi bounced in for a couple of his eight points there. But nice control of the game. Geelong by 11 at the finish. Simon Curl has now led his team scoring in the last three matches. Can't do much more. Mark Nash's 18 boards were a career high with his 10 offensive rebounds, four short of Simon Cottrell's Hobart record. David Stiff, well, he fouled out for the second consecutive game. Brisbane's road trip began at the Glass House, a big test of their unbeaten record. The Giants destroyed them in last year's playoffs, ending a pretty controversial season. But that's a long way off now as we prepare for a special game. The Bullets went into the game undefeated and leading the league. The Giants warming up after dropping game one. Tony Jensen fired in a triple to get things started. But the Giants went inside to Pat Reedy to establish an early lead. Mike Mitchell meant business with an emphatic slam. Jensen a constant threat from the outside. Larry Sengstock couldn't do this again if he tried. Money for jam for Loggins as the scores were tied at quarter time. Loggins and Mackay were having no problems with the Giants' zone. Jensen producing a remarkable drive. And when McDonald got out on the break, the Giants were up by nine. Some late points from Mitchell kept the Bullets within five at the main change. Mitchell connected from long range to reduce the margin after the break. The Bullets lifting their intensity and taking command in the third. Steve Woodbury couldn't miss and big Mark Dalton was playing inspired defence as the Bullets blew the lead out to 12 points. Giants coach Brett Brown was getting ready for a tough finish. Trailing by 10 at the start of the final term, Jensen got hot again to nail two long bombs while D-Mac was taking it hard inside to reduce the margin to two. McDonald. Reedy came up big down the stretch to tie the scores and put the Giants up by two with seconds left. A three-point attempt from Mike McKay missed, but out of nowhere came Woodbury with the tip in to send the game into overtime. Well, we're going to let you hang there just for a couple of minutes. After this, we'll bring you the overtime from that great match at the Glasshouse. Expected road win. So we're into overtime. David Graham, what's your to report from the sidelines? From the sidelines, it's an interesting trend that appears from uh, the coaches in the league with their overtime strategy, and that is to run the ball as hard as you can, shoot it up, slip in the streets. Shoot it up and sleep in the streets. Can you decipher that? Please? No, have no idea. Reedy the fade away. All I know is this game came to life. The last two minutes woke me up. Let's hope you haven't turned the TV off because this is an absolute beauty. Well, 
We've been very lucky, Dean, the last oh. two weeks. Two overtime games. More overtime. Do we get paid overtime? Well, that's negotiable. Do we get paid? We certainly do. Ball Rees to the line. Free throw percentage for the North Melbourne Giants tonight. 54%. 13 out of 24 from the line. McDonald, of course, of course, missed his previous two. With 15 and a half seconds remaining. Could have nailed the game. Absolutely. Rees gets just one. And that is the difference in the ball game. It's North Melbourne 85, Brisbane 84. We're into overtime. Five minutes of that. The Canberra Cannons would be enjoying this game. Wouldn't they what? Of course, the Bullets have to back up tomorrow night and play Canberra in Canberra. Again, passing the ball around. Mackay can't get it. Mailey, big rebound. That's his seventh ball. Turnover. Mackay, Smith, Mitchell underneath. Elliot. Oh, and that is a big foul from Jensen. Big collision. Fair start, but I think it's the right decision. I see it coming. Bang. Well, he definitely, in my mind, had possession of the ball and needed to be protected. Little alley oop. Yeah. And they can really take the wind out of the sails, those ones. So Mitchell at the line. 23 points at 57%. Six of seven from the free throw line. Add to that eight rebounds and you've got close to the MVP standing right there. Yeah, it's been a gutsy performance from Mike Mitchell. And it's uh, the bullets up by one, 86 to 85. Extra five minutes of overtime. Everything remains the same. The foul count, timeouts, and of course the score. It's a North Melbourne ball. Sloppy passing by the Giants. Jensen thought the shot clock had gone down, had a quick look at it, decided not to take it. It's inside two. Dean and Steve, down here on the sideline, I'm predicting double overtime. Big prediction. Woodbury. Now Smith to Loggins for three. This time, Leroy gets it. It's... The Bullets by two, 89-87, three minutes left. Loggins, four three-pointers. <laughs> Tough shot by Rudy, Rudy. makes it look easy. Classy shot from Pat Rudy, he's up to 20, and it's the Giants 89, the Bullets 89. Little fade away by Pat Rudy there, very classy shot. Great strip oh, of the ball. Strip. Ripped him off the ball. McDonald against Loggins. <laughs> An obvious foul. And the D-Mac will go to the line. Here's a replay. Jensen did well in the end to get it to McDonald. There's the first foul, and there's the second one. So, McDonald, can he respond this time? Yes, he can. Well, under the D-Mac, he's got the first. And he makes the second. So, it's the Giants up by two. 91, Bullets 89, two minutes 20 left in the game. Full court pressure by the, the Giants. Mike 
Mitchell was screaming for the ball at the other end of the court. There was no one within 30 yards of him. And they've coughed it up. Another violation as they failed to get the ball in within the five-second count. Mitchell was just all alone. Rees banging inside with Mitchell. Jensen shoots off the glass, won't go. Rebound, Smith. Good rebound by Smith. That's 10 rebounds to Roger Smith. Outstanding game. Just the four points. But what a job on the boards. Giants by two. Mitchell muscles his way inside. Oh, he's called the block. Big play. That'll be off Jensen. He's called it. No, he's called it away at the Giants. She wins. Steve? It's all happening, Dean. Oh, what's your decision here? Well, I couldn't see, actually, because there's the cameraman right in front of me. <laughs> Have a look at this block. Straight up now. Oh, boy, that's a big, big call. Well, coming up, we'll have the War of the West, Adelaide and Perth and a beauty. Brisbane moves on to the capital to play. Tom Marr will talk about the Ovals, but of course, right after the break, the conclusion to this featured game of the Glass. Oh, wow. Knocked it down. Four three-pointer for Tony Jensen. Five the difference. Bullets. Mackay drives. Smith's hurt it. on the sideline. The and foul's on Mackay. Yeah, so the Giants will go to the line. And he's let the ball go. And he's been called with the foul. Players are going down everywhere. And Smith is uh, quite badly hurt at half court. There was the Jensen three. And he'll gonna be, he's going to be limping off court is Smith, and it looks quite serious. Yeah, Smith's done his ankle. He came down on top of uh, Ruiz when he went over and uh, just tweaked his, uh, his lateral uh, ankle there. Well, I'll tell you what, you're right, Dean. The camera cannons will just be absolutely thoroughly enjoying this. Uh, it's unfortunate because, really, the bullets, I think, down the stretch have been a little stiff. Yeah. But can't take anything away from the home side. They fought back from a pretty ordinary third term. Well, they scored just 11. They look, it's not over yet, but they look as though they might go on to win this one now. It's out to seven. 96-89. Very cheeky. Very cheeky little pass off uh, McDonald's back there from Leroy to get the ball back. Totally legal. He's thought about it. Loggins. Air ball. It's a north ball. So you think now this game is over. There's a minute two left. It's north by seven with possession. Jensen will be sent to the line. And you're right, Dean, you do have to feel for the Bullets. They've played their heart out tonight and against the odds. And Mitchell's been a little bit hurt. Of course, Sibley's not there. Dalton's obviously affected. And, uh, well, it looks like now they're going to go down, but not without a brave fight. You're right there, Steve, particularly when at the end of the regular time they did have that three-pointer from the corner from uh, firstly Leroy Lawrence with about 26 to go that would have probably won them the game and the second chance by Mike Mackay, so they have been a little bit stiff. Jensen up to 24, and it's the Giants by nine. Mackay. Mackay again for three. Makes it this time. 98-92. And Jensen will be sent to the line by Loggins. Second foul only on Leroy Loggins. And what a great game he has had. 22 points, 8 rebounds, 4 big 3-pointers. Well, Tony Jensen just continues to keep on going. Great pickup for the Giants. Really is a scoring machine. Not happy with that miss. I know what North Melbourne will be doing at training this week. Yep. No doubt. Free throw percentage is very, very poor. This is them both. It's a Brisbane ball. Almost pilfered by McDonald. 
All the bullets need is a three here, and uh, we've got another ball game. Let's hope they get one. Mackay. Up they, it goes. Oh, get it. Oh, 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 it's all went back into the game. Oh. But Maley jams it home for two. Just what the bullets didn't want. Back out to five. Another three coming up. Oh, Woodbury drive. He's stripped of the ball. Turnover. Now you think the Giants are home. That's going to play a little bit of keeping off here. Keep the ball moving. Reese. Foul is called. That was a big three-pointer by Mike McGuire under all sorts of pressure, but unfortunately, quick transition basket and a big dunk by Maley has put the game beyond the Brisbane Bullets. And what a season we're having, Steve, in the Mitsubishi Challenge. It is going to be a terrific season. And that is the ball game. Ten seconds to go. North 102, Brisbane 95, Mitchell for three. Not this time. Rees the rebound. Giants ball. The Giants have won here against the Brisbane Bullets and a great game of basketball, great sportsmanship at the end. In the first period of overtime, it's North Melbourne, 102, inflicting the first defeat of the year on the Brisbane Bullets, 95. Ah, uh, well, is D-Mac a big-time player? I think so. Tony Jensen fitting in beautifully with the Giants. You can credit Brett Brown a lot for that. Pat Reedy, a stock game for him. He does everything, doesn't he? And they did it without a big scoring contribution from Paul Maley. Interesting. Mike Mitchell carrying a lot more responsibility on the boards this year for the Bullets. They're not as big in the front court. Leroy Loggins also contributing well. Likewise, Steve Woodbury, remembering Sibley out with injury. One incredible game, part of a very tough weekend for the Brisbane Bullets, but Dean Templeton said it, the Mitsubishi Challenge this year is going to provide us with many, many more games of that calibre. All right, let's move sideways just a moment, talking about great games. There are many coming up this weekend outside the Mitsubishi Challenge. Now, I'm talking about the Australian Opals. They're considered one of our strongest medal chances in Atlanta. Testing that, a terrific four-team series, which starts tomorrow. 36 has lost only one match so far, and that was on the road to South East Melbourne last weekend. Plenty of excuses there. The Wildcats had also lost only one game. Now, this was to be another test of the supposedly small Adelaide front court without, of course, one of their key players. The 36ers went into the match without Captain Mark Davis, who broke a finger at training during the week. As he watched from the sidelines, his troops made a frenetic start. The Wildcats on the back foot from the outset. Brett Maher is off to Atlanta. His form during the first quarter was outstanding. The point guard didn't miss a beat. Catalini gets his first touch. Formerly from Perth, Maher from three-point territory. Big 15-footer. Passes off to really plenty of time. Three-pointer, no. Bit of an anti-climax. Here's Brett. Can Brett complete it? Yeah! Rick Brunson was also on song. And at the first break, Adelaide led the Wildcats 32-12. But the visitors didn't panic. They went into a man-to-man -man defense and clawed their way back. Aaron Traher controlled the show and made Adelaide pay. Vlahov and Fisher were also solid. And at the long break, Perth was within nine. The third quarter was even as both sides battled for an advantage but the tempo increased a notch. Transition basketball, the order of the night. At the last break, the Wildcats edged even closer, trailing by just five points. It became the biggest test for the 36ers at home this season, but Perth wanted to spoil the show. Home side leads, Fisher. Can he help his side claw their way back? Yes, he can. Mar for three. Long way out. Didn't really look like it. Here's Brunson, and Brunson scores two valuable points. The reigning champs soon took the lead and never surrendered it. At the finish, they won by four. Their top scorer was Scott Fisher with 25 points, Vlahov with 21 and Traher 16. For the Sixers, Brett Maher with 24 points and Rick Brunson 18.
They will be two very strong teams this year. Let's go back to that Brisbane road trip now. Next stop, Canberra, where the Cannons staged a mighty comeback last week to shatter the Kings. This time, they had the bonus of a fit and hungry Robert Rose. The Brisbane Bullets came to Canberra as the form team in the competition, winners of their opening three games and narrow overtime losers to North Melbourne in their match on Friday night. The Cannons were welcoming their second import into the NBL, the brilliant Robert Rose. is now sitting inside, nice pass, Robert Rose. The first quarter saw both teams missing the basket more than they were hitting it. In fact, it was a very low percentage of around the 30% mark. It was 21-18 at the end of quarter time. The second quarter was very similar to the first. The cannon shooting just 36% to the bullets 29%. The scoreline at the break, 39-35. In the third quarter, the Cannons started to step up. They were now starting to shoot in the low 40%, while the Bullets were still struggling to hit the range. Robert Rose certainly started to come to the fore. Three three-point shots in a row had the Cannons looking good. The final quarter was all the Canberra Cannons. Robert Rose was still dominating, and Chris Blakemore was picking up the scraps. 98-87 was a true reflection of the game. The Cannons finishing with a shooting percentage of 45, while the Brisbane Bullets, who never got hot all night, finished with a low 36%. David Close completed five of eight three-point attempts. Chris Blakemore nailed both of his. Darnell Mee was one board, two assists, and three points shy of a triple-double. Mike Mackay's 27 was his highest score in 77 games. Believe it or not, you've got to go back to June 25, 1993, in fact. Beat that. A great win here at the AIS Arena. First, up, first home performance for Robert Rose. I guess a little hiccup last week when you weren't able to play. Only two weeks to settle in with the team, but in a scrappy game where most players were having it very difficult to find the hole, you found it very easy. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I guess the uh, extra week off, I really didn't want the extra week off, but I guess the extra week off gave me a little bit more time to settle in and get the plays down and get to know some of the, some of the guys I didn't know a little bit better. And, uh, you know, my shot was going a little bit tonight, so, yeah, I was kind of pleased with that. And the other thing, very interesting with your team this year, is both you and Darnell Mee, very similar type of players, sharing the point guard roles in between you? Yeah, not a problem at all. I mean, Darnell, he's a very good handle, very quick, gets to the basket very, very easily. And if he doesn't have the shot, he can just give it up to one of the big guys down low. But yeah, we'll definitely share the point guard spot this year, and I don't have a problem with that at all. And let's hope the Palace sells out for the rest of the 96 Mitsubishi Challenge season. A couple of other games played this weekend. Let's check the scores right now. The Battle of the Steel Cities, Illawarra versus Newcastle. Great performance there from Matty Zorna. That's 27 points was a new career high for him, in fact. Marcus Timmons set a new Illawarra record for defensive rebounds with 18 to go with his 22. And Van Dyke solid as usual for the Newcastle Falcons and Bradkey. Well, MVP Butch Hayes, a milestone. Melbourne and Townsville now. Let's have a look at that score. Cameron Dickinson filling some of the gaps left by Derek Rucker's absence. Yes, that's right, they did not have Derek. And he became one of the few Australian-born players, Cameron, to outscore Andrew Gaze in a game. Interesting little note that. Gaze himself hit seven of seven foul shots. He now leads the league, having made 24 of 25 this year. After the break, statistical leaders and a complete rundown of the weekend in our national leagues. Welcome back now. We'll recap the weekend results in the Mitsubishi Challenge, taking a look, and things are rolling along pretty well for the South East Melbourne Magic. North Melbourne also had a win. They're looking very good now after that first home loss of the season, or away loss, I should say. Geelong and Melbourne also winners this weekend. Very important one for the Tigers, that. Moving along to the Illawarra-Newcastle game, that was pretty important too, but Illawarra got that one. Tom Wisman with a little bit to think about, I guess, during the week. He has a very different team this year, so a few adjustments to make from last season. Canberra, likewise, a different team, but boy, if they bought well in the import department. And Perth had a win over Adelaide, but that's always going to be a very close one. Checking the ladder, and South East Melbourne, North Melbourne and Perth all leading, and that's fairly predictable. Adelaide on three and two, still settling in. Brisbane... Canberra, they're all on three and two. Now, Melbourne and Illawarra have broken into the top eight on a 50% record, but I think it's going to be a close year. Sydney also on 50%. Newcastle, pretty close, two and three. The Gold Coast, at least they have a win. So too is Geelong and Townsville. Hobart, 
No, naught and five, but gee, I've seen them play a couple of times this year and uh, that must be disappointing. They're a better team than that. Now, the stats leaders so far in 1996. Five of the top ten scorers are Australian born. The highest score of the round was actually by an Australian outside the top ten. That was Cameron Dickinson, 38 against the Tigers, a new career high. Robert Rose's 31 point season debut was next best with Roberts, David Van Dyke, Tony Ronaldson and Melbourne buddies Bradkey and Gaze, all with 30 points. That's this weekend. Top rebounders now. Marcus Timmons leaped from fifth to first as he grabbed a weekend high of 22 against the Newcastle Falcons. Mark Nash's 18 was the next best, but of course not enough to get him into the top 10 yet. Mark Bradkey's 15 against the Suns, however, moved him up to second place. Top assists. And we see that Andrew Gaze, is he pretty good or what? Andrew Gaze had 12 against the Suns. That was the weekend's best. He moves into the top spot on assists. Marginally ahead of Greg Smith. Great to see the youngster that Ian Stacker is bringing along on 10 assists. Now, he had nine this weekend, incidentally, in that game. Daryl McDonald lurks not far behind. He had eight on Friday night. And D-Mac probably well aware that he is no longer leading the assists in the league and some very, very big names right behind him, including... Well, Peter Harvey, who's a big name in assists, he finished the season brilliantly last year and he's kicking on. Now, the WNBL, and a reminder, the Opals are much different Melbourne Tigers this year. Moving along, and we see that Dandenong had a win over Perth, so the WNBL a lot more even, at least at this stage of the season, than it has been in the past couple of years, although the one exception is, of course, Adelaide Lightning, who keeps striking. They beat Brisbane by a comfortable 15. Let's check the ladder out right now, and there you go. Adelaide, the only unbeaten team. Great to see Canberra up there in second spot. Sydney holding on pretty well, along with Bulleen and Dandenong, but it's great to see Bulleen and Dandenong in that top five category. Moving down a bit further, you see Brisbane there, and surprise, surprise, for the first time in a couple of seasons, you got Perth and Melbourne down towards the bottom with the AIS and Tassie yet to score. But of course, it's very early in the season. Next week in the Mitsubishi Challenge, more great matchups coming up. Have a look at this. Hobart hosting Brisbane, and really Hobart due to do something in this league. Brisbane, of course, trying to turn around that double road loss. We've got Townsville hosting Melbourne. Newcastle and Sydney, that'll be a great game. North Melbourne and Geelong, that's just Friday. Gold Coast host Melbourne on Saturday. Then we've got Adelaide and Illawarra. That'll be a big game. Sydney hosting South East Melbourne, possibly the game of the round. Uh, but Perth and Canberra is also a fantastic matchup. So take your pick. But uh, those bottom two certainly look like to be terrific games next weekend in the Mitsubishi Challenge. But that's pretty much it for week four. I'll be back a little later with more highlights for you uh, with sports tonight and, of course, NBA action. But right now, we'll say goodbye.